this. There we go. Um, you cannot use your cell phone as a calculator. So um, no cell phones because you can, you know, Google on there. So you, um, uh, any, any calculator, uh, you know, a TI-30, a Casio 98, a blah, 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 whatever, um, any calculator and a writing utensil. The exam center, wherever you go, should provide scrap paper so that you can write anything you want down. I recommend, uh, recommend that you organize your thoughts on that scrap paper because when you finish, you're going to hand that scrap paper back to the proctor and that person is going to scan it and send it to me via email. So that when I grade your work, if it's a six point problem and you have the wrong answer, with no work and a wrong answer, you get zero out of six. With work, you might, I might say, oh man, you knew what you were doing, but you, you know, wrote down a four instead of a three, you get five out of six. So you, uh, you can, you know, you get partial credit there. Uh, when is the exam? Uh, the exam is whenever you get in to take it. Yes, it has to be done no later than Saturday at noon. So if you wait until Friday to schedule it and your testing center says we can't get you in, that is not my emergency. So hopefully, um, if you haven't scheduled your exam with your testing center, you want to do that as soon as we get off this, this class today. Um, because different testing centers have different times that they're open. And um, yeah, you need, to, you need to schedule it. You can schedule it online the way we talked about last week in our session. Um, but it has to be done no later than Saturday at noon. And with that being said, um, that's also when everything from Unit 1 is done, right? All the homework, the Excel assignments, the discussion boards, everything that we did, sections 1 through 9, all of that homework is due officially at noon on Saturday. So more than likely on Sunday night when I get home, I will be sitting down and anything you don't have done becomes a zero. And all of your homework that I haven't put grades in yet, because if you don't have a perfect in your homework, I didn't enter it in because I wanted to give you until Saturday to work on it. So, but on Sunday, everything is closed. Everything is zeros. Or if you got a 56 out of 70, that 56 will come over. So your grades will be updated and I will send out an announcement. Uh, I hope you're reading the announcements because that's how I'm doing all of my communication in this class. So if you're not reading the announcements, you're missing a ton of information. So. Um, I will put an announcement up that says your grades are updated, and then you can go in and check things out from there. So um, hopefully you all are taking it at an IV Tech. Um, I've only had one student contact me about a different place. We've got that taken care of. Because if you're not taking it at an IV Tech, I have to confirm with a person there, like back and forth communication, and I will not send a proctor form until I have it confirmed, all of the details that I need. So, you know, it's Wednesday at 1 o'clock. This is due in less than uh, 72 hours. So hopefully, um, you know, you guys have, have things in place. If you need help or questions, you've got my email, you've got my office phone, feel free to give me a call, shoot me an email, and we can kind of figure it out from there. Okay. Um, one other thing about the exam, there is a practice exam located within Module 5. Module 5 is where the exam is located, right? That's where you will go in to take it when you go to your testing center. And there is an answer key with uh, that practice exam, okay? A lot of people didn't see that because you're not going through the modules, right? And I'm not going to tell you how to take the class. You do what you want to do. Um, but if you go into Module 5, under, I think, learning activities, you will see a practice exam loaded, um, which is just, you know, it is, you know, it's not through IV Learn like the exam is, but the questions will make sure that you're ready for the exam. So if you haven't found that yet, there you go. Okay. Any other questions regarding Unit 1 or Exam 1? I did read through discussion boards the other day where people had posted, you know, I'm struggling on section four, number eight, whatever. I emailed those students individually with help on questions that they posted. Um, if you have questions on certain sections, I mean, through the rest of this week even, well, and the rest of the summer, feel free to shoot me an email. and I will get you hints, videos, whatever I can find um, to help you get through that material. But you have to ask. If you don't ask, I don't know that you're struggling. I don't have time to monitor 30 students, every assignment, which ones are you not doing. I don't know if you're not doing it because you don't get it or you're not doing it because you ran out of time. 
I don't know. So unless you ask a question, I just assume that you're doing fine. Um, so make sure that you're reaching out if or when you need to. That's kind of on you. Okay. Um, anything else? Section, uh, excuse me, Unit 1. Or are we ready to go to Unit 2? Scott, is it a written test or on the computer? Scott, the exam is on the computer. Um, it's going to be through Ivy Learn, just like you've been taking your quizzes, basically. And we all know there have been grading issues with the quizzes. Um, so when you take your exam, don't be discouraged when you see the score. First of all, there are some that automatically assign a zero until I grade it because they're free response. You don't get points for something I haven't graded yet. So, you know, you may have a 50 when you finish the exam. But when I'm done grading it, you'll end up with an 82, right? So don't look at your grade when you're done and think, oh, my gosh, I did horrible. Think Becky has to grade it. We'll deal with it after she grades it, okay? It's still, and there might be coding issues with some of the formulas and that kind of thing. I haven't looked to see if there are any issues in that. Um, we did have an issue with some of the images not always showing up. Um, so if you have issues with that when you take the exam, I think I fixed them. That doesn't mean I did. Uh, just go ahead and let your proctor know that which problem or write it down on your scrap paper. Problem 10 did not load. Whatever. Um, now I do know which ones are having issues. So don't do that for the ones that you don't know how to do because I'll that'll be a kind of a red flag. Okay. So um, any other questions? But you will log into ID Learn when you get there. You'll go into Module 5, Exam 1. At the computer screen, your proctor will type in the password that he or she has from me, and then you will take the exam just like you are taking your quizzes through IV Learn. Any other questions? Okay. In a normal semester, um, the week of the exams, this is all we do. We talk about it, and then we might do some practice problems, but only from what students need. At this point, if you don't have any questions on particular problems, we're moving on to Unit 2 because that's where we're at. So if you're thinking, um, I can't think about Unit 2 until after I take the exam, some people have that mindset, then you might want to log off now and say, okay, I need to start this video seven minutes in. Take the exam tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, whenever you take it. And then after the exam, watch the video, right? Because I post all of the links to these videos under the announcements. Um, and so if you, th that might be better for some of you, but I don't know. I don't know how your brain works. So we are now going to go into sections 10 and 11. 10 and 11 are not on exam one. They are in unit two. So it's all new information. So if you leave, I'm not going to be offended. But I do recommend you come back and you watch it because we are going to hit a lot of information over sections 10 and 11. But I know some of you have already taken the exam, so this might be a good jump part, uh, jumping point for you for um, section unit 2. All right, so here we go, unit 2, sections 10 and 11. So the rest of the stuff that we have due this week, after you finish the exam, I do wish for you to get into the two sections, 10 and 11, um, where you have WebWork 10, WebWork 11, and an Excel assignment, dosage calculations, one quiz, and one discussion board. So it doesn't seem like a ton compared to the last week, but you also have an exam that you're expected to get through. So let's go ahead and start talking about conversions. So the first thing that we're going to do in section 10 is basic conversions. So that's conversions with U.S. customary, with metric, U.S. customary and metric, and, um, and then kind of putting those things on steroids and making them bigger. So when we talk about U.S. customary, and you really, really, really should have page 245 out if you don't already. Page 245 is yellow, and it has all the conversions you're going to need in this section, well, in this unit, really. Page 245, something just like it, you will have on the exam. So that is uh, also super important to re recognize. But uh, when we do conversions with U.S. customary, we do things with identity ratios. We use identity ratios to, um, to create these. Now, an identity ratio is saying like 12 inches is one foot. 
That is an identity ratio. Okay, and I say that because the top and the bottom are equal, right? There are 12 inches in one foot. We also could say that one foot is 12 inches. There are two, excuse me, there are two ways to write every identity ratio, right? Just flipping them. And we call them identity because if you think about your identity, it's who you are. And the identity, top and the bottom, are the same. So how you know which identity ratio to use when doing conversions will depend all upon the labels. And I know that labeling is not okay in the real world, but in math, labeling is crucial. So we want to make sure that we're labeling all of our numbers within our conversions. And you're going to see just how important this is in a few minutes. Now, I know that some of these problems are going to seem very simple, and you're going to think, well, Becky, duh, I just divide, or duh, I just multiply. That's great, and I'm happy that some of them are super easy and you can just do them. However, if you don't learn the process with the easy problems, you're going to get to the hard problems and you're going to be screwed. And if you don't understand the process, there's not much I can do to help you when we get to the hard ones. You've got to understand the process for the easy ones so that we can build to be more difficult. Okay, so I hope that makes sense to you. All right, so let's go ahead and go to the next first problem. My pedometer said I walked 11,520 feet yesterday. How many miles is this? All right, so when we're going through and we're going to do a conversion, um, first it's kind of important that you recognize what you're converting. So we can kind of see we have feet, we want miles. These are labels, right? And when you're doing these conversions, you always start with what's given. I'm given 11,520 feet. So that's what I start. And I always, doing conversions, I want fractions. And you can hate fractions all you want, but this is super important. And to make 11,520 a fraction, I simply put it over one. Right? Now, when you think about the fractions of your past, which I know probably haunted some of you, when you multiplied fractions, you could reduce top to bottom, okay? Now, thinking labels only, if I have the label of feet in the numerator, and I want to think about canceling or reducing, whatever kind of words you want to think in your head, if I want to cancel out the, the label of feet, where will it go in my green ratio? Will feet go in the top or will feet go in the bottom in terms of canceling them out? bottom, Scott, exactly. Because when we reduce, we always reduce top to bottom. Okay, so I often try to tell people, um, Caitlin, you have 90 minutes to take the exam. I don't know if it's going to take you that long, but after 90 minutes, it will close out and you're done. So you should, you have 90 minutes for the exam. For these problems, you're going to let your labels guide you. So if I started with feet, my next conversion has to have feet in the bottom. All right. So when I look at my yellow sheet, you can see the top part of the yellow sheet is U.S. customary units. And I have feet and I want to go to miles. Can I go feet to miles? Yes. I can see that the third one down in the far left box says one mile is 5,280 feet. So this is why your labels are super important, because now you can see that my feet are going to cancel out, and I'm left with the label of miles. Now, there's a couple ways you can do it. One way is you can multiply across, just like we do in math, in fractions. right? You get 11,520 on the top. You get 5,280 on the bottom. To simplify that, I would divide. So I can divide those and end up with 2.18 miles. Now, I said there's multiple ways because you can also think of this as you start with 11,520. To go to the bottom means to divide. So then I would divide by 5,280, and that will also get you to the 2.18. So if you think about in the top, if the numbers are both in the top, you multiply. If you start in the top and go to the bottom, you're going to divide. Right? So anything in the top is being multiplied. Anything in the bottom is being divided. And that is our first problem. All right, please stop me if you have questions, comments, concerns, or suggestions. I think I'm all caught up in the chat box, but you just never know. So that's problem number one. All right, let's go to problem number two. Oops, I hit a wrong button. Erase all drawings. Here we go. I bought a gallon jug of juice. How many cups is this? What are we going to start with in this problem? 
gallons, exactly. And it says a gallon. How many is a? <laughs> one. Very good. So we're going to start with one gallon of juice. I'm going to put it over one to make it a fraction. Okay, now looking at your yellow sheet, I know to get rid of gallons, gallons have to go in the bottom. Now, I want to go from gallons to cups. Does my yellow sheet tell me how many cups are in a gallon? You did not answer my question. Does my yellow sheet tell me how many cups are in a gallon? I didn't ask you how many cups are in a gallon. I asked you, does your sheet tell you that? The answer is no. The sheet says one gallon is four quarts. Right? So if you do math on the side, you can figure it out. But based off what your yellow sheet tells you, this is my next step because I'm getting rid of my gallons. And I know there are four quarts in a gallon. That step right there gets rid of my gallons, but it puts me in quarts. And I do not want to be in quarts. So then I need another step. To get rid of quarts, I would put them in the bottom. Based off my yellow sheet, I know that one quart is two pints. Right? So, again, that makes my quarts go away. My label is pints. But, again, I don't want pints. I want cups. So, my, I can put pints in the bottom to make them reduce. And now I know that one pint is two cups. Pints reduce. And now I'm ready to do some math. So because all of my non-one numbers are in the numerator, I simply multiply across, and I end up with 16 cups. Yep, 4 times 2 times 2, exactly. So some of these problems, especially if you do a lot of cooking, these things are probably very, very, they come naturally to you. If you do a lot of measuring, those, some of these U.S. customaries are going to be very easy for you because you've done them in your life, and that's great. You can show as much or as little work as you want. But if you don't understand this process and these four steps now, when we go from kilometers to yards, you're going to be completely lost. So make sure you understand the process. That's all I'm saying. Once we get going, you can do things however you want. I, I don't care how you do it. I just need you to understand how these pieces all fit together. All right, let's go to number three. I bought a 17.3 pound turkey. How many ounces is this? What are we going to start with in this problem? Pounds. Excellent. Okay, so 17.3 pounds. One thing I like about these problems is they're all... They kind of have the same process when you're doing U.S. customary. You want to get rid of pounds? Well, it starts in the numerator, so to get rid of them, I'm going to put them in the bottom. Now, when I look at my yellow sheet, I'm going from pounds to ounces, right? This is weight. This is the third column. And I can see that one pound is 16 ounces. Whoa. That Z got a little out of control. That makes my pounds go away because they're both in the numerator. I multiply. And this 17.3 pound turkey is 276.8 ounces. Right? Any questions about U.S. customary units? We did one of each, length, volume, and weight. Basic concept of that. We call this the factor label method. Um, dimensional analysis sometimes is how it's called. Um, I call it using identity ratios. You can call it whatever you want, but it's using fractions, right? Now we are going to jump to, that's the wrong button, conversions in the metric unit, okay? Now, you can do conversions in the metric unit with uh, the dimensional analysis if you want. To me, that's a lot of work. If you know how to count to seven, actually, you only ever need to count to six, um, your life is a whole lot easier. So you'll see on this page, I teach the counting method. When it says unit, that can be meter, liter, or gram, depending if we're talking about length, volume, or weight. Same three categories as the U.S. customary, right, of length, volume, or weight. Now, when you look at your yellow sheet, 
you see that it has meter, liter, gram, and it's got the deci, centa, milla, deca, hecto, and kilo, right? You got to be able to count. So this is, and you're going to be given this exact sheet, so you have the order, right, of which way goes what. So if you throw an, an M after this, right, you have hectometer. You throw um, an L, you have centiliter. So that's, that's the only way that these things change. All right, let's go ahead and uh, do a problem here. So we're going to do uh, one together, and then I'm going to have you guys do one. But here it says we want to change 380 centimeters to hectometers. All right. So 380. Right now, looking at this 380, where is my decimal point? Do you see a decimal point? Three. Excellent. Good. You guys wrote it out. Good. It's at the end. So sometimes, if it's right, if it's not there, it's at the end. Make sure you're paying attention to that. Now, with this again, I'm talking you got to be able to count. So we're going from C to H. I start here. And if you're a visual person, you cross it out. That's where you're starting. Now, I want to move to H. Watch how we do this. One, two, three, four. I moved left four places. And this is why I'm talking if you can count, you're golden. So we already recognized where our decimal point was, and I, I put it at the end of my zero. And now I want to move that decimal four, left four places. So one, two, three, four. And here's my new decimal point. I got an empty hump, so I put a zero. So 380 centimeters is 0 0.038 hectometers. you got to be able to count. If you can count, you can do metric conversions. So X out where you're starting, and then count your humps until you get where you're going. All right, you guys try one as soon as I get there. Go ahead and change 4.5 kiloliter to deciliters. We've got our first answer. we got a second answer. Let me change colors for fun. Notice that we are starting with kilo. So that's here. We're moving to just a D, not DA. So we're going here. So I want to move one, two, three, four. Right four is where we're moving our decimal. So one, two, three, four. I've got three hump well, that is the ugliest number I've seen in my life. And I end up with forty five thousand deci liters. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to your the, the units there. Deca has a DA. So for this problem if it was decaliter, it would look D A L is what it would look like. Okay. All right. Everybody okay with those? We need to do another one. You guys good. Good? Great. We're not doing another one. The third one, third spot that we can do is I call it jumping across the pond. U.S. customary is used in U.S., and I think one other country uses the customary units of measurement. Everybody else in the world uses the metric system. So, like when I was in um, Ireland and Scotland between spring and summer semesters on a trip, um, everything there was in metric, and it was very, very interesting, especially to see gas prices. We should do that. I should throw that in here. Because their gas prices look really low compared to ours. However, they're per liter, not per gallon. And if you understand the difference between a liter and a gallon, huge. Um, maybe I'll throw that one in here in a minute. But anyway, so when I say jump across the pond, that simply means we're going from customary, oops, forgot the S, Customary to metric or vice versa, metric to customary. So if you look on your yellow sheet, page 245, the third box down has conversion between U.S. customary and the metric system. 
you'll notice that not everything has a conversion. So there are times that you might have to convert first within the customer unit before you can jump across the pond to metrics or vice versa. You might have to go from kiloliters to liters and then from liters to quarts and whatever. So you kind of, again, let your labels guide you. That is crucial when you're dealing with conversions. So let's do some of these. We're going to start with some easy ones. I weigh 170 pounds in my dreams. And so what is that in kilograms? Well, part of the, the you know, issue with this or the process is recognition. So when you see pounds, that should register that this is a customary unit of measurement. Anything that you're used to seeing, because we use it here in the States, is customary. Kilograms, however, is not. So you should see right away that I'm starting in customary, I'm moving to metric. So I have 170 pounds. And any time that customary unit is you know, started with, we've got to think factor label method. So I've got pounds. Now, when you look, can I go from pounds to kilograms, or do I have to do some fancy work first? Can we go pounds to kilograms? Yes, yes we can. If you look at, so it's the third section down on the sheet, all the way on the right, you see that it says one pound, because this is weights, right? Pound is, these are weights, is the same as 0 0.4536 kilogram. And this is one that you're going to use actually quite a bit, pounds to kilograms. So when we have pounds to kilograms, that makes my pounds go away, right? We're reducing top to bottom. And now I'm in the label that I want. So I don't have to do any more conversions. Both numbers are in the top, so I simply multiply across. And I would weigh roughly 77.112 kilograms. So the next time you're feeling, I don't know, chubby, just feel, change your weight to kilograms. And that should make you feel better. I do that on a regular basis just to make myself feel better. So, uh, you know, that's something that we all can, we all can do. But that's kind of the key is looking at your yellow sheet and deciding, you know, what can you do based on what you have. All right. So my trophy is 170 centimeters tall. How many inches is this? So again, important thing to recognize centimeters is metric. Inches is customary. So we're going to have to jump across the pond. Now, I'm starting in metric. Well, if I need to go metric to metric, I, I can count. So I don't necessarily need to do a factor label right away. First thing I want to see, can I go from centimeters straight to inches? Is that possible based off our chart? We're looking third section down, first column. Yes we see it says inches to centimeters. So that tells me, okay, if I start with 170 centimeters, because again, we always start with what we're given. No, a meter is not three feet, Scott. That is not true. That is not true. Um, and a centimeter is not 100 meters. You need to make sure that you're using your yellow sheet. Okay, that is crucial when you're using things that you're not familiar with. Um, so we have our 170 centimeters, and based off our sheet, it tells us, again, we want centimeters on the bottom, and we know that there are 2.54 centimeters, that has to go on the bottom, for every one inch. So it's, again, you've got to let your units determine what numbers go where. So because centimeters top to bottom cancel out, now because 2.54 is in the bottom, and I, am I going to multiply or divide in this problem? We are dividing, yep. So you're going to take 170 divided by 2.54, 
and we should end up with roughly 66.93 inches. And again, make sure that you have your labels. Okay. Don't, you know, just based off of, you know, Scott's message about a meter is three feet. Don't make assumptions on things. You always want to use facts. Facts come in for the form of this yellow sheet. And write it down. What are you given? Where does that take you? If you try to do everything just holding your calculator without writing anything down, I guarantee you're going to make mistakes. Um, just trust me on that. I've taught this class for a long time. Take the extra 15 seconds it takes and write it down. Okay, so now our third one, we're going to deal with volume. And 16 ounces is how many milliliters? Okay, so we have ounces and we want to go to milliliters. So, if you look at the volume, we, again, we rec hopefully you recognize that we're going to have to jump across the pond. Ounces is customary, milliliters is metric, right? So, that's the observation that needs to happen in order to jump across the pond. Now, can I go from ounces to milliliters? Looking at the third section down, under volume, can we go ounces to milliliters? Nope, nope, we can't. We can go from quarts to liters. So the first thing we need to do is get this to be quarts because then that can go to liters and then from liters we can go to milliliters. So this is kind of our conversion. Ounces to quarts, quarts to liters, liters to milliliters. If you can kind of think through that, okay? So let's take the steps needed to do this. So we start with 16 ounces. From ounces, what can I do? Because remember, you got to think about this. I want to get rid of ounces. Ounces go on the bottom. What can I change ounces to? And I do not want to take shortcuts, people. Ounces to quartz is not on your chart. You can't go from ounces to quartz in one step. Okay? I want to do every step step by step because when you take shortcuts people get lost and we make mistakes so if you want to take shortcuts on your own you knock yourself out because i'm not there sam we can go ounces to pounds if we're talking about weight because pounds is weight ounces come in two different forms we have fluid ounces which is talking about liquid right thinking about your can of pop um or pound ounces can be weight if you're talking about how heavy something is so in this particular case, liters, if you think about, if you're not sure, are we dealing with weight or volume, thinking about milliliters, well, a liter of pop is liquid. So we'll be dealing with volume, the middle one. And nope, we don't go to pints either. Ounces go to, do you people have page 245 in front of you? Very, very top one, top section of this page, U.S. customary units. In the middle, it says volume, and it tells us that eight fluid ounces equals cups. Darlita coming in to save me. Thank you. So eight ounces is the same as one cup, right? Step by step process. If you understand the steps, the hard problems will not be hard. All right, so that makes my ounces go away, and now my label is cups. Well, remember, I don't want cups. I want quarts. So I need to change out of cups. Again, cups is in the top, so I'm going to go cups in the bottom. What can I change cups to based on my sheet? And don't say ounces because that goes backwards. Pints, exactly. So it tells us that two cups is the same as one. Pint. Okay. Okay. So now we're in pints, which so we're getting there, right? Closer. What can I change pints to? Pints go to quarts. So two pints is one quart. 
All right, so for all of you people who wanted to take a shortcut earlier and divide by 4, you would have been slightly wrong because you missed the 8. So that's why I'm saying taking shortcuts on your own, that's when you're on your own. But if you write them out, you're less likely to make that mistake. Okay, so now we're in courts. We have achieved this first step. Now I'm ready to go to leaders. So if you look uh, at the bottom, third section down, because from courts to leaders, right, we're jumping across the pond. The pond is right here, and we're jumping across it. So we know based off courts is in the top, so we're going to put courts in the bottom. Third down, it tells me that one court is approximately 0 0.9464 liters. And that makes my courts go away, and now I'm in liters. Now, if you recall, from liters to milliliters, we counted. We didn't do a fraction. We simply counted. So I'm ready to get myself a number so that my last step can be counting. So when I'm looking at this five pr fraction problem I have here, I'm ready to go ahead and do the math. So I start with 16. Every number in the bottom is divided. So I divide by 8, divide by 2, divide by 2. Number in the top means multiply by 0.9464, and my label will be liters. So if we multiply that out, how many liters is this? Good, so I have 0.4732 liters. Stop me if you're lost. Okay, now we got to think liters to milliliters. Which direction and how many spots do I move my decimal? So now look at your metrics. Liter is a unit. So that's right in the middle. I want to go to milliliters. Which direction do I have to move? Three to the right. Good. To the right. Because milliliters to the right of liters. So we're going one, two, three. So my final answer is 473.2 milliliters. So quite a few steps in that problem, but the math, the math itself is not difficult. All of you can count. I believe in you that you can all count to at least three. And I know you can all multiply and divide because, well, we have calculators that make that easier. So the math part of this is not difficult. It's the setting it up and making sure you have the numbers in the right position. Taking shortcuts, taking shortcuts, um, will be your detriment. That will be the biggest issue with these problems, is that people want to do things quicker, and that leads to issues. Okay. All right. Okay, so now we're, uh, that's section 10. Um, basic conversions within customary, within metrics, and then customary to metrics. So we'll go from there. All right, so temperatures. I'm not going to spend a ton of time. We're going to do two of these, and that's it. If you look at the fourth section down on page 245, you have two formulas. The first formula talks about going from Celsius to Fahrenheit, and that's because the formula is F equals 9 fifths C plus 32. I know this is going from Celsius to Fahrenheit because you can see what's within the, I call it the beef of the equation. So because Celsius is in the middle, I, if I have Celsius, I can plug it in here, and it's going to poop out a Fahrenheit temperature. Similarly, the second formula there is C equals 5 ninths times the quantity of F minus 32. You will notice in the blue equation there are parentheses. In the pink equation, there are not. Do not mix that up. And don't add them where they don't belong and don't get rid of them where they do belong. So the parentheses are crucial in the order of operations of these problems. And we will show that in the next two problems that we are going to do. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to change 70 degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius. 
Now, they give me Fahrenheit. I want, I want Celsius. That means I want to use the formula that has Celsius by itself. Because if I want Celsius, that means I want C equals something. So this is the formula that I'm going to use. Now, I have 72 degrees Fahrenheit. What am I going to do with that 72? Yeah, we're going to shove it in so we can subtract something. So it's going to go in here for F. So I have 5 ninths times the parentheses of 72 minus 32. Now, depending on your calculator, you might be able to type that in exactly like you see it. The, or you might not. I mean, it told, I don't know what your calculator looks like. Order of operation tells us to subtract first. So what is 72 minus 32? 40. Thank you. And now we have a nice, nice problem here. We know... I'm going to throw that out there and just say, yeah. Fraction bar is the same as division. So this gr dark green, changing to light green, is the same as 5 divided by 9 times 40. And that's your last step because in the order of operations, we multiply and divide left to right. So we would just go ahead and do it exactly like you see, as Nathan typed in the chat box, 22.2 degrees Celsius is correct. Okay. Super, super important, though, that you make sure you do the uh, inside parentheses first before you start multiplying and dividing. Very, very important. All right, let's do the other temperature problem. Change 4 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. Sounds worse than it is. We're going to Fahrenheit, so I want to use F equals 9 fifths C plus 32. So I'm going to take that 4 degrees and plug it in. And I end up with 9 fifths times 4 plus 32, right? Because a number touching a variable is multiplication. So when I'm focusing on this first part, because multiplication comes before addition, I'm going to take 9 divided by 5. That's not how I wanted to write it. 9 divided by 5 times 4. What is 9 divided by 5 times 4? Seven point two. All right, so you have seven point two. Then you add thirty two, and you end up with thirty nine point two degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. The hardest thing with these problems is making sure you have them in the right spots. Right. You have the right formulas. No extra parentheses. Not lacking parentheses and that kind of thing. All right. Excellent. Moving right along. Wrong button. All right. Uh, so section 11, which I thought temperature was 11, but maybe not. Um, more conversions in section 11. Both of these sections are conversions. The difference is section 11, I call them conversions on steroids. Um, they're a little bit more involved. They're a little bit bigger. Uh, there's some odd conversions, which is the ones at the bottom of the page, ones that we don't normally see, right? I think that you guys probably convert feet to inches maybe on a regular basis. If you cook, you're doing pints to cups to ounces, whatever. But not very many of us convert square miles to square kilometers or cubic inches to cubic feet. Those are things we don't do on a regular basis. Or we don't say, hey, there's 6,000 gallons of water in my pool. I wonder how much that weighs. Those are things that we don't do every day. And therefore, the conversions are a little bit, uh, I don't know, they're different. So two things that we are going to deal with are area and volume. And if you remember, area is square units. By square, I mean raised to the second power, right? So we would have inches squared. Cubic means raised to the third power, so we would have like feet cubed. And I bring this up, obviously, for a reason. Because if you have area or volume and your exponent is a little bit different, this is going to tell you how many times you need to do the conversion, right? Every problem we've done so far, our labels have been inches, feet, centimeters. The exponent has been one, right? If there's no exponent there, it's automatically a one, and therefore we've done the conversion one time. If you have inches squared, then you need to be doing two conversions because inches times inches 
equals inches squared, right? We've got to do it twice. Feet cubed is feet times feet times feet. So we would do the conversion three times. And talking is cheap, so let's go ahead and do one of these. What is the area of a sheet of paper in square feet? I highly recommend you pay attention to this problem because I think this problem is in your homework. I think this exact problem is in your homework. Mm, you might be going to square centimeters in your homework. But anyway, you definitely, definitely are going to start with an area of a sheet of paper. Okay, so I'm basically going to give you the first part of a homework problem as long as you're paying attention. So, a sheet of paper. What are the dimensions of a sheet of paper? Because if you don't know that, super hard problem. Um, the dimensions are like length times width. What are the numbers? There we go, Nathan. A sheet of paper is generally 11 inches by 8.5. That is a standard issued piece of a piece of copy paper. So if we want to find area, paper is generally a rectangle. Remember that area, and this is on your sheet, um, area of a rectangle is length times width. So if I want to find the area of my sheet of paper, I can do so by taking 11 times 8.5. What is 11 times 8.5? Ninety-three point five. Okay, so I have ninety-three point five, and my label, inches times inches, is inches squared. Now it's inches squared because there were two of the inches, right? Inches and inches. So now, when I think, okay, I want to go from inches to square feet. Inches to feet should be easy. How do I go from inches to feet? Well, I have inches in the top, so I'm going to put inches in the bottom. How many inches are in a foot? 12, thank you. So there's 12 inches in one foot. Now, hopefully you recognize that inches squared up here in green and inches are not the same because this inches is one inch. Inches squared has two. So I need to do the exact same conversion again. Nice thing is you don't have to think about what the conversion is. You just have to do it twice. Because inches times inches, again, just like we did the last, last sheet, inches times inches is inches squared. So if I have these two, they will cancel out with the inches squared. And my label is now feet times feet, which is feet squared, square feet. That's what I want. So my numerical, right, 93.5 divided by 12, divided by 12, how many square feet do I have in this particular problem? 3.9 is not correct. you got to start with 93.5, divide by 12, and then divide by 12 again. You're dividing by 12 twice. There we go, Jessica. Jessica, you're sending your messages to just me, not the entire group. I don't know if, if you're doing that on purpose, but, um, I mean, it's fine. I, I can still see it. So I'm going to go ahead and round just for simplicity. 0.65 square feet. Oh, there you go. No problem. I didn't know if you knew that or not, or if you cared. It doesn't matter, you know, um, given your information. So 0.65 feet squared is our final answer in that particular problem. So Scott, I'm not sure where you got 3.9. Um, no, not sure. Oh, I think you just, um, after you did it by 12, I think you just uh, divided by 2 the second time. You might have just missed a number in the calculator. So, um, so make sure you're doing divided by 12, divided by 12. Details are crucial. Crucial. All right, in this one, I'm, you can set these up sometimes in a few different ways. So in this one, a bag is 18 inches by 16 inches by 2 feet. What is the volume in cubic feet? Now, what's wrong? What's the problem with this problem? What makes it a little bit more difficult than the one we just did?
Any idea? We are dealing with cubic feet. Uh, inches to feet. Yes, we are going to need to go inches to feet. Our final answer um, is wanted in cubic feet. So we do want our final answer being cubic feet, but when you think about the problem, we're trying to find volume. Volume is found by taking length times width times height. And again, this is on your sheet. But when you do that, all three of your sides need to be in the same units. And if you notice, inches, inches, feet, those are not all the same. So in order to, to do this volume, you either need to have all inches or all feet. And it doesn't matter because if you do it all in inches, then you can do the conversion to cubic feet and it's fine. Either way, you're going to be fine. So in thinking about this, I personally think if my final answer needs to be in feet, let's go ahead and change things to feet. So basically I'm going to say 18 inches. I need to change that to feet. Well, there are 12 inches in one foot. So how many inches, excuse me, how many feet is 18 inches? One point five, thank you. So I have one point five feet. So instead of eighteen inches, I have one point five feet. Then we go to the next one and say, okay, now we have sixteen inches. Same concept, twelve inches is one foot. My inches cancel out. How many feet is sixteen inches? And let's go to like three decimal places. Very good. 1.333 feet. So now I have a bag that's 1.5 feet by 1.333 feet by my last one that's already given, 2 feet. So now I have three dimensions all in feet. So when I want to find my volume, length times width times the height. So I want to take 1.5 times 1.333 times 2. And what is the volume in cubic feet of my bag? Roughly. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just round it because I'm lazy. So we're going to have roughly four cubic feet of space. Now, if you think about a cubic foot, I always think of this kind of like a little ottoman that is a foot on each side. That's a good size foot on each side, and then you have four of them. That's how big this bag is. So, you know, kind of enormous. All right. So that's a volume of a rectangular dealio. Now we're going to find the volume of a cylindrical shape. A soup can is five inches tall with a radius of two inches. What is the volume in cubic centimeters? All right, so we think about our soup can, right? It's a cylinder. And if you, if you look at your yellow sheet at the bottom, it says the volume of the cylinder is pi r squared h. So for pi, you can either use your pi button on your calculator, or you can use 3.14. Um, I think web work has been... Uh, coded both ways. I don't remember about um, IV Learn, but I think you should be okay. Uh, obviously, we'll fix them as we come upon them. So when we're looking at this problem, I'm going to go ahead and just use 3.14 for pi. My radius, well, this thing, it says it's 5 inches tall. It's got a radius of 2. So the radius is 2. i got to square that times the height of 5. Most calculators will allow you to just type this in as you see it. Um, if not, 2 squared is 4, so you can always change that to a 4 and then multiply. And these, of course, are all inches. They are the same. That's why I could do it. 
what is the volume of this can in inches? Roughly. 62.8. Yes, and this is cubic inches. So I have 62.8 inches cubed. And it's cubed because, some people like to know why it's cubed. You have the height, that's in inches. You have the radius in inches. And remember, square means you took two and you multiplied by itself, and then you multiplied the five. All three of these, right, because both radiuses have labels of inches, and the height had a label of inches. So inch, 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 that's cubic inches. Now I'm not done, because the problem said they wanted cubic centimeters. So, again, remember, one inch is 2.54 centimeters. And because this is cubic, I need to do this three times. So that's what, again, letting your label guide you. And I say that because inches cubed, you had that three, that tells you one, two, three. You needed three inches. So when I say take 62.8 and I multiply by 2.54 three times, you should end up with roughly 1,029.63 cubic centimeters. Right, multiplying across. And of course you would label or uh, round accordingly. When you're doing these problems, you want to do um, most of your rounding at the very, very end. You don't want to round too early because it will throw off all of the rest of your calculations. So you really want to make sure that you um, go as far uh, as you can before you round. Okay, now we're going to take that. You'll notice that this said 14A and we're going to do a 14B. We're going to change that to milliliters. So this is a super easy one. If you have um, 10, oops, I need a pen. There we go. If we have 1,029.63 cubic centimeters, and I want to go to milliliters, did anybody find that uh, it's, the, it's under special conversions on page 245? Can anybody find the conversion for cubic centimeters to milliliters because it's super fly awesome. Going once, going twice. We're kind of running out of time. It's almost two. We're going to go over a little bit today, but again, you can leave and, and watch the rest of it later. Um, cubic centimeters to milliliters is a one-to-one -one ratio. And, and I love that because I can multiply by one like a beast. Right? So the cubic centimeters go away. I multiply by one, it changes nothing. So 1029.63 milliliters changes nothing. Super, super nice. Super nice. All right, we're just going to keep chugging along. If you have to leave, please do. Just if you could come back, pick it up around an hour. Then, right? In section 15A, my rectangular pool is 18 feet by 10 feet by 6 feet. What is the volume in cubic feet? This is the easiest problem we've done all day. Notice that all three of the dimensions are already in feet, and we want feet. So volume, again, rectangular, is length times width times height. So 18 times 10 times 6. What is the volume of my pool? Ten eighty, and that's cubic feet. Good. Okay. Multiply those together. Golden. We're going to take that answer and we're going to move to part B, because of course we have part B. How many gallons of water is this? Well, if I have one thousand eighty cubic feet, and this is where we get into special conversions. If you look again in the middle of the uh, conversions, it says one cubic feet. One cubic feet is 7.4805 gallons. So a special conversion allows the feet cubed to go away. They're in the numerator, so we multiply. And we're going to end up with 8,078.4 gallons. How are we off just slightly? You have 94. 
Is it a nine four? Did I need? Did I not multiply? You guys both have nine four. I'll trust you. I'm going to add that to my paper then. Nine four. Okay. So we have nine four gallons of water. Just multiplying those again, letting your labels guide you. Where are you at? Where do you want to go? All right. So then we go to part C. What is the weight of that water? Well, if I have 8,078.94 gallons, again, looking at your sheet, you probably have noticed that one gallon of water, and this is only water because different liquids have different densities, but one gallon of water is approximately 8.33 pounds. So that makes my gallons go away. And how many pounds is that? Excellent. So they're in the top again. So we multiply. So 67, 297.57 pounds. Exactly. So those are, you know, special uh, conversions that we don't see on a regular basis, which is why they're listed under special conversions, right? Super, super creative there. But something interesting. All right. Um, we've got a few more that I want to kind of get to. Uh, we, we'll do 16 and then we're going to jump, I think. Um, to 18 and we'll be done. So in 16, you'll notice in this one it's a little bit different. I ran 5.3 miles per hour. And if you recall back from unit one, per implies a fraction bar, right? Per one hour. So we start with 5.3 miles per is the fraction bar, one hour. Now this basically is a rate, right? It's, it's say rate because it's a by per time type of a thing. But now I have labels in both the numerator and the denominator. So when you look at what is this in meters per second, I want to go from meters per second. I need to change both the top and the bottom. And not just that, but I need to change my miles. I need to jump across the pond, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say I'm going to change those miles to kilometers. And there are different ways to do this, right? You can take steps in different orders. But I want to say, based off my sheet, that one mile is the same as 1.6093 kilometers. And so when I multiply those together, I have 1.6093 times 5.3. Oops, I hit a wrong button. I end up with 8.52929, and that's kilometers per one hour. Well, recall that's kilometers. I want meters. And kilometers to meters, I'm going to move right three places. So here's my decimal, one, two, three. That means I have 8,529.29 meters in one hour. Now, that's, I'm not done. But that puts me in meters, which is half of my problem. So the other half of my problem is going from hours to seconds. And you got to kind of think differently here. So right now I have hours in the denominator. So to get rid of that, I'm going to put hours in the top, right? Because they reduce top to bottom. So one hour is 60 minutes. And that's great that I get rid of my hours, but I'm still not in seconds. So. I do one more step and I say, well, I know that one minute is 60 seconds. So that beautiful step makes my minutes go away. And now my label is seconds, which is what I want. So I can take my last step and take my 8529.29 divided by 60, divided by 60, and that will lead me to the promised land of approximately 2.369. I'm going to go ahead and round. And that is meters per second. And this is, this is kind of a problem that I'm talking about when I say if you don't understand the process, I'm not really sure a shortcut way of going from miles per hour to meters per second without asking Siri and having somebody else do the math for you. Fortunately, you can't do that on an exam, so you probably shouldn't do that now. 
right? Um, and these are the exception, not the norm. Most problems are not going to be super, super detailed with multiple, multiple steps. But if you can do this problem, you can do any of them, right? So I do think it's important that we practice those and we introduce those and we talk about those because they're good. They're good problems. All right, I want to do one more problem. And I want to point out that the three of you that are left, take note of this. All right, so Sam, Nathan, Darlita, you have an Excel assignment called dosage calculations that you, that you have to do. This right here, problem 18, is that assignment. This is what you have to do in that Excel assignment, which is why I throw it in here. So you can do, you don't have to use Excel for that assignment if you don't want to. Actually, I guess it's a Word document. You can do it all by hand if you want. Um, but this is what you have to do, this exact process. You're given a patient with a particular weight. Steve weighs 188 pounds. When your drug dosage, if you are sick or in the hospital, whatever, the amount that they give you is dependent upon how much you weigh. However, many, many, many drugs are um, dosed based off of uh, the metric system, right? So milligrams per kilogram. So knowing that Steve weighs 188 pounds does us no good because the amount of drugs that he needs to get is based off of his kilogram weight. So our first step is always to say we need to take these pounds. Steve is 188 pounds. We need to take those pounds and convert them to kilograms. Now we've done that already once a long time ago at the very beginning of this section. And we know that one pound is the same as 0.4536 kilograms. So I'm not kidding. The, this is going to give you the step-by-step -step details of what you need to do for that, um, that homework assignment. It's not in web work. It's, it's under you know, the other assignment. It's a Word document right now. So that blue step takes us from pounds to kilograms. And after we have kilograms, you can see the dosage is 25 milligrams per, implies the fraction bar, per one kilogram. So kilograms are in the top in the blue fraction, so I know that my one kilogram needs to go in the bottom. Per one kilogram is compared to 25 milligrams. And so that step right there will tell us total milligrams, right? So these three people, uh, three steps here, will give us the total milligrams for Steve. However, generally, you do not get dosed up with all the medication you need at one time, right? This problem says it's to be given twice a day. So we're going to take our final answer and we're going to divide by two because it's divided into two doses. If it's to be given three times a day or every eight hours, you divide by three. So for this particular problem, we're going to take 188. We're going to multiply by 0.4536. We're going to multiply by 25. And then we're going to divide that into two doses. So Steve should be getting roughly 1,066 milligrams per dose. And in that assignment, um, that assignment that I'm referencing, you're given, I think, like eight or nine patients. You're given their weight, and you're, you're told how much they were drugged, right, their dosage, and you have to determine if they were overdosed or underdosed based off of this problem. So you're going to do this calculation for every one of those patients and then make a determination. Did you overdose or did you underdose, or did they get approximately the right dose, right? If Steve would have gotten 1,070 milligrams, I would say that that's fine. Nobody's going to die from four mil. Oh, maybe they will. I don't know. But um, you know, if it's close, you're fine. It's really when it's off by. You know, if they would have given him ten thousand milligrams, that's a big, big difference. Um, so this problem is very evident of that extra assignment you'll be asked to do in section eleven. Yep. Okay, that's all I'm going to do for this one. It's ten after. We'll call it a day. Do any of you have any questions about any of this? No? Okay. If you don't have any questions, you're free to go. Uh, make sure you get your exam taken before uh, Saturday at noon. And if you have any other questions, you know, shoot me an email, give me a call, whatever you need, and uh, I'll be here to help. So thanks for staying. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. And uh, have a good week. Good luck on your exam. Bye, everybody.